getting started in just about one minute. Good afternoon. For those of you who've just joined, this is Amanda bergson Shulkak at the National Skills Coalition. We'll be starting in just a moment. Good afternoon. This is Amanda Brixen Shokak. I'm Director of Upskilling Policy at National Skills Coalition. Welcome to today's webinar, Upskilling Adult Learners with Disabilities, How State Policy Can Support Collaboration Between Adult Education, Vocational Rehabilitation, and Workforce Development Partners. Today's webinar will be recorded, and a link to view the recording will be sent in a follow-up email along with our slides uh, to you tomorrow in email. If you have questions during the webinar, please type your questions into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the webinar, but if we don't get to yours, we will answer them in our follow-up email. So just to give you the big picture, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the issues that we're covering on today's webinar, and then I'll be joined by our terrific partners in Texas. Um, because this is a cross-systems conversation, we have quite a number of panelists on the phone with us today, and so they will be muted until uh, they are making their portion of the presentation, just to minimize any background noise. So let's talk about the big picture, right? Um, so when we think about issues related to adult education, workforce development, and people with disabilities, the big picture is that seven out of 10 people with disabilities are currently working or want to work. And so it's really important to have that context in mind as we think about these issues. Um, we'll be talking, I'll be talking a little bit about the landscape just to open up, and then we'll zero in on the Texas example. Um, and you'll hear from our panelists, including both local representatives from the rural capital area, as well as state government representatives. We'll talk briefly about the implications for other states and localities, and then we'll get to your questions. Please do feel free to use the question and answer box throughout the webinar. Um, you don't have to wait to the Q&A period at the end. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that we have hundreds of you across the country listening today, um, and 91% of you are from states outside of Texas. So we think that's a wonderful illustration of the keen interest that a lot of folks have in this topic. Um, and frankly, we know that a lot of you are doing interesting and important work in your parts of the country, um, and we welcome that, uh, hearing more about that as well. So let's uh, get the big picture context. So many of you may have seen the email that came out from National Skills Coalition yesterday around upskilling adult learners with disabilities. It's a policy brief. It does do a case study of our Texas partners who are joining us on today's webinar, as well as provide both state and federal policy recommendations. But really the impetus behind this brief was a recognition that people need access to high quality services, that the systems that are set up to serve them are not always as well aligned as they can be, and that there are things you can do, whether you're working at the local level, whether you're a state workforce or adult education or, or voc rehab policy advocate, or whether you're at the federal level in order to improve the functioning of these systems and ultimately improve the outcomes 
for the people who are being served by those systems. So as context for the kind of legislation we're going to be talking about, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, I know many of you who are listening today know this legislation like the back of your hand. For some of you, you may be newer to the field or less familiar with the sort of big picture. Um, LIOA was reauthorized with overwhelming bipartisan agreement in Congress in 2014. It includes a number of different chapters, which in Washington speak are known as titles. Title I is Workforce Services, provides about $3 billion, as you see on the slide here. Title II, Adult Education, so that's uh, adult basic education, adult secondary education, GED or high school equivalency classes, um, and English for speakers of other languages, um, as well as integrated education and training opportunities. And then Title IV focuses specifically on vocational rehabilitation for people with disabilities. Now, Congress has encouraged states and localities to collaborate across the WIOA title. Many states have already done so and are um, moving towards greater collaboration and alignment. Um, sometimes that's documented in a WIOA state plan that states have submitted. Sometimes it's not formalized but is more informal in nature. Um, in the adult and workforce field, we often talk about co-enrollment of people between Title I and Title II. Um, it's not something where we see large numbers nationwide, but we recognize that there are a lot of folks in high school equivalency or adult basic ed classes who either have a job goal or would like to advance in their careers um, and could benefit from Title I services. Um, and there are also a number of folks in Title I services who could benefit from boosting their foundational skills, whether that's English, math, or reading. Um, but there's less conversation nationally, not none, but less, around co-enrollment with Title IV, um, either from the adult ed side or even sometimes from the Title I side. And that really depends um, on the specifics in terms of how different states and localities are kind of approach and implement their services, who's co-located where. But one of the reasons we wanted to lift up this issue in our brief was because we know and we hear from National Skills Coalition members on the ground that there's an unevenness in the field nationally. And while many adult educators know that there are learners in their classrooms who have disabilities, oftentimes those disabilities may be undiagnosed or unaddressed, so they're not accessing VR services. We know that oftentimes VR staff are aware that they have a customer that could benefit from adult education, but they may not be familiar with the full range of services and activities that adult ed partners can provide. And we'll hear about that today in our Texas example. And then we know that our workforce partners in the Title I world um, have really varying degrees of expertise and connection with their VR system, sometimes very strong, sometimes less so. So Today, we're going to hear from leaders in the rural capital region outside of Austin, Texas, who have spent the past several years building a tighter connection between systems. And we're going to get practical about what does that actually mean and what does that really look like. Um, and then we're going to hear from the Texas State Adult Education Director, Anson Green, about his office, about how his office, rather, has supported those efforts um, at the state level to help local partners um, have the flexibility they need to, to pursue the alignment they want to pursue. The larger context for the work in Texas is the fact that the Texas State Legislature a few years ago moved the State Vocational Rehabilitation Agency under the umbrella of the State Labor Department, which is known as the Texas Workforce Commission. However, National Skills Coalition does not take a position on whether states should do that. Um, and that's not the topic of today's webinar. We know that most states around the country actually don't do that. Um, and so the reason we've, we've approached this webinar is to really say to folks, okay, can we talk about what good collaboration and partnership across systems looks like regardless of how the state actually um, has set up, you know, the sort of agency infrastructure? Um, and we hope that you're going to walk away today with some very practical ideas for how you can approach these issues regardless of whether you work on them at the federal level, at the state level, or at the local level. And for those of you who've heard me speak before, you know that the reason that I care about policy work, and I imagine the reason that many of you care about policy work, is because it can affect 
the lives of people. Right? So we're connecting the dots today between when systems work better, how does that make things better for the job seeker who walks in the door, who might be hard of hearing, who needs an integrated education and training class, or the person who's dealing with serious mental illness, um, who's eager to find their first full-time job, or whatever the particular characteristics of the person who's being served might look like. Um, so I welcome all of you to our discussion today. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize this point um, about people with my first slide of people. Um, I think it's particularly important to do this on a webinar where I can't see you and make eye contact. So we recognize that people are multidimensional, but systems sometimes aren't. And that's really the kind of focus of our conversation today and why we're going to talk to our partners from Texas. So just to help orient you geographically, the area we're focusing on is in central Texas. So on today's slide here, if you look at where the red circle is, inside that red circle is kind of a, an oval-shaped donut of light blue counties. Um, and those counties comprise the rural capital area. It's a set of nine counties that surround but do not include the city of Austin. Um, and this is a sort of closer up version of those nine counties surrounding the capital. So just to help kind of situate you in terms of the region of the country that we're talking about here. So I'm going to be joined, as I said, by a number of different speakers, uh, Robert Alexander and Robin Ferris from the Texas Workforce Solutions Vocational Rehabilitation Services Office, Monty May and Chris Caballero from the Workforce Solutions Rural Capital Area Agency, Doug Mudd and Francesca Ramirez from Community Action Incorporated of Central Texas, which is the adult education uh, partner on the call, and then at the state level again, Anson Green of the Texas Workforce Commission. So I'd like to start um, with our partners at the Workforce Solutions uh, team, Monty and Chris, um, can I ask you to unmute yourselves and just start with a quick overview. Can you talk about how long your agencies have been involved in this collaborative process and how many different people and agencies are around the table? Sure, good afternoon, Amanda. This is Monty. Um, we actually have been collaborating more with memorandums of understanding for several years. We're from a rural community, but in 2016, we began, began to make more concerted efforts to collaborate for the needs of our customers and began a process of meeting together with vocational rehab, adult ed, and workforce partners formally to just begin the process of knowing more about each other's programs and formalizing a type of referral process for our customers that would make it easier when they needed services that frontline staff and management knew what services were available, not just with their own organization, but also with the two sister organizations of, um, in our case, it would have been adult ed and vocational rehab. And we understood that we needed to get the buy-in from, of course, our board and our organizations, but we also needed to have the buy-in of frontline staff and management. And that was kind of the key. So in 2016, on a rainy afternoon, we got partners together from vocational rehab, from adult ed, from workforce, and all met together in one room and had an outside facilitator kind of guide us through knowledge of all programs. It was someone who was not really in any one agency, but knew the guidelines for all the agencies and for lack of a better word, kind of refereed that first meeting. And um, I can say, I personally think it was a big success. We may have made referrals in the past to a, another agency, but to actually get that referral a direct contact 
and to know what services the other agencies had was pretty much what one of our major goals were. That's great. Um, and, and can you talk a little bit more about the fact that you brought in this outside facilitator? Why did you think that was important? Um, how long did you work with the facilitator? And what funding did you use to pay for that person? Initially, I believe the, the and Anson Green from the state office can talk about this a little more in depth, but initially we used, I believe it was Title II funds from WIOA and brought in all three agencies. Why we decided on an outside facilitator just to have an unbiased, unsiloed view of what everyone did. And they, I guess the very first meeting we had was just that, the very first meeting. It was something that we kept following up on, both at management and board level, but also frontline level. And it was very important to have a facilitator that could see everybody's point of view and assist with heading in one universal direction. And the facilitator, I don't know if I could even remember how many times he met with us. He met initially and then there were several follow-ups just to make sure that it wasn't a good idea and then a dropped idea but that it was an idea that had a concrete basis and follow through for the customer's benefit. That's great, thank you very much. Um, I, we've gotten a question in the Q&A box that I wanted to just address in real voice here um, without responding via text because it may be a question others have. The question is around whether there's captioning available for today's webinar and my sincere apologies, but we do not have captioning available for today's webinar. Um, I will follow up individually with the person who asked that question after the webinar to see if we can get um, written materials that would be helpful. Um, but if anybody else is interested in this issue, please just shoot a quick note in the Q&A box um, so that we know to follow up with you after today's webinar as well. Okay. Um, so I want to turn now to the partners on the vocational rehabilitation side, Robert and Robin. Um, and I'd like to ask you, you know, we've just heard from Monty about this process of getting an external facilitator and getting everybody in the same room and having both higher level uh, sort of executive staff, but also having frontline staff engaged in the process, the fact that you knew you had to have kind of a more structured formal process. But before you could get to the big issues like policy, you really had to build some trust and some shared understanding. How did that begin? Uh, this is Robert. Good afternoon. Um, Mr. Greg Newton was our facilitator, and I, I can't talk any more highly of an individual uh, than, than the meetings that we had with him. Right off the bat, we spent the first full day really understanding how each of our individual services work together for the bigger picture and how it was gonna serve our community and our customers uh, better in achieving uh, successful outcomes. Um, we talked about our goals and really how they were gonna, in the future, they were gonna intertwine and that you know we could work together in developing a really strong uh, structure and program and system um, or that you know if we didn't come together that there was a really good chance that we were going to fail in the future with our benchmarks so he kind of hit the mark on why it was important and then some of the work activities um, they just really gained a lot of trust and we realized that we were all really in this for the same reason and that we would work better together than in silos great and one thing i you know think uh maybe of interest to other folks listening today to this conversation is sometimes that those exercises to build trust and understanding can be very micro in in level in the sense of just coming up with terminology that everybody felt comfortable with. Are we gonna say job seeker? Are we gonna say customer? Are we gonna say adult learner? How do we even refer to the people that we're serving? 
So speaking of the micro level, it can be kind of tempting when you're thinking about collaboration to jump right into figuring out logistical details like what kind of form are we going to use for our referrals? How did you kind of step back and develop a big picture shared vision of what the partners were trying to work towards before you got bogged down in those details of, you know, what does the form need to look like? We really started developing a plan in our second session with the end in mind, and that was our customer success. Uh, we, we looked and, and identified gaps that each of our program had. Um, we agreed that you don't send customers to a program. You send customers to a person. And those points of contact and personal relationships were going to be extremely important. Uh, then we started working on developing a desktop aid and each program spent some time on providing a summary of which each one of us does. If we had an eligibility criteria, uh, services, what somebody could expect day one. Um, and then we provided the necessary tools to our team to ensure that it was user friendly. We trained our staff and then we rolled out the program. That's great. And just to help folks picture it a little bit better, when you say desktop aid, is that a document? What what was the desktop yes, aid? Yes, ma'am. We had um, like vocational rehab. We developed a desktop aid. At that point, we were two different uh, programs. So General VR had one and we kind of gave a summary of what that program looked like, services, eligibility, uh, blind, visually impaired did the same thing. Adult education did the same thing and work development partners. And uh, we combined all of those documents. And as we were rolling it out, uh, every uh, staff member, there was a possibility of referring someone to uh, another program, uh, received that documentation. And then before, and I think this was extremely important, before we ever implemented the referral system, every staff member got trained and we and there's where we made sure that we all had the same uh, understanding we we had buy-in on like 48 hours uh when you refer somebody to me you had 48 hours i i gave you my guarantee that within 48 hours my team was going to contact that customer and see if we could actually help them or not and then the referral system gave them an opportunity to, for us to input the information so that all team members knew that we dealt with it and how we dealt with it. That's great. Um, thank you so much. I want to turn now to the partners at the adult education side of the table. Um, those of you who know me know that I spent nine years working in direct services doing adult education and workforce development before I came to National Skills Coalition. So all of this work is, is near and dear to my heart, but I'm very familiar with what it's like to be in a small nonprofit. So Doug, I'd like to start with you and just say, your agency is a, we owe a Title II provider, an AFLA provider, um, but it is a nonprofit. You, unlike the other uh, folks on the webinar today, are not formally a government agency. So what was it like for you coming to the table with public agency partners? Were there constraints that they faced that you don't have to deal with or vice versa? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure, yes. Um, I'd have to say definitely there's you know, different constraints between uh, us and uh, voc rehab and, and workforce. Um, although our, our community action organization is not, as you said, a government agency per se. <clears throat> But all our programs, including adult education, uh, Head Start, our, we have an energy assistance program, health services program. Um, they're all governed by federal and state uh, government agencies, um, but we're not uh, a government agency. So, um, but I, I, you know, I do have to say this: um, we often feel like you know a little a speedboat in an ocean among giant steam engine ships of vocational rehab and workforce. So. You know, we're here. We are buzzing around. You know, you know, we're we're moving fast, um, and you know, trying to stay aligned. And and um, you know, oftentimes we maybe we're moving too fast. You know, um, so as a result, sometimes you know, our staff, you know, had maybe had the expectation of getting things done faster, and um, you know, make you know, and and having change. You know, it, it's it's difficult with uh, you know with 
we have less constraints as far as um, people. Uh, we have uh, less, you know, employees um, and uh, less, you know, bureaucracy to deal with. So, so both VR and, and, and workforce have more staff members and, and many of them move up and, and maybe they change positions, which affect new processes that are put into place. And not to mention, I'll say this, that uh, VR, I mean, a vocational rehab just uh, went under the umbrella of Texas workforce. And we were trying to make changes and they were undergoing a lot of change. Uh, and I know that affected the, the process, but, um, but anyway, in coming together, there was a lot of learning to do and, and slowing down on our part was, you know, very important uh, but you know we're used to partnering we've partnered with workforce uh, you know capital area for many years um, in a different capacity and um, you know and and we're used to uh, you know working on limited funds so we are used to adapting usually you know we're having to uh, you know buy for classroom space and child care and, and that kind of thing so um, but yeah, and in partnering, you know, we've become accustomed to, you know, working with agencies. So although there was some anxiety surrounding getting things going and uh, getting things going faster, you know, we've adapted well to it, so. That's great. Um, so one challenge that often faces adult education stakeholders in a collaboration is if their partners are unaware of the full scope of services that adult education encompasses. I sort of refer to this informally as the problem in which people say, oh yeah, you're the GED people, um, without yeah. realizing that adult ed is doing integrated education and training and a whole, could be a pre-apprenticeship program, could be a whole host of other things. How did you and your partners in rural capital work to ensure that each of your agencies was fully aware of each other's capacities and offerings? Oh uh, yeah, good question. So yeah, about five years ago, you know, like you said, we were a GED type program or an ESL type program. And you know, and that was it. And we got referrals for people who need high school equivalency preparation classes or um, people who are limited English and, you know, and we have that reputation, but you know, things have changed. You know, WIOA happened um, with, you know, Title II funding. We've, we've got more uh, services we can provide. Um, and also, uh, our program is under new leadership. We have, um, you know, we're under uh, Texas Workforce with Anson Green, and he's, you know, we, we've blown it up since, you know, since they've come on board. So, so now we uh, provide a variety of services, like you mentioned, IETs, EL civics, IETs, work-based classes, programs for immigrants with degrees, et cetera. Um, so we do a bunch of stuff and com communicating that and getting that out, um, it, you know, it takes a while, but uh, it's, you know, it's getting out there little by little. Um, but in reference to our, our partnership, uh, the biggest barrier we identified uh, in developing our integration processes was not knowing what each of us has to offer. So, you know, during that work group, you know, the three entities um, have taken time to, you know, basically discover each other. And now, um, for adult ed in particular, having funds for these <clears throat> workforce training options, you know, the IETs and such, we have definitely become uh, more appealing you know, to workforce and voc rehab partners and, and, and having these IET funds has definitely encouraged the collaboration because ultimately it, it sets up a situation where we're interdependent, each needing the other. And um, we rely heavily, heavily on this referral process to recruit um, for all our students, but especially for our integrated education and training programs. Um, but getting, getting back to the question here, uh, also, as a part of our uh, early integration meetings, um, in order to understand one another's capacities and offerings, um, at the work groups got together to develop, and I, I know Robert mentioned this uh, earlier, but our desktop uh, guides, um, and that's for frontline staff uh, to know what services the other two entities provided um, in terms of eligibility, age serve, and services provided. And uh, we also created together a fact sheet, which is for, for us, for the customer to use, so we can hand off to the customer from the other entity. So, but I have to say, just in the process of developing fact sheets and these desk guides, um, we've learned a lot about each other. And, and that's, I mean, it's really strengthened our relationship, uh, which 
really is one of uh, the goals of this whole integration process. That's great, um, and I think such an important point, right, that working collaboratively to develop the handouts that talk about what each partner does can itself be kind of a professional development exercise in which each partner is becoming more aware. I want to turn now to Anson at the state level um, and ask him a couple of questions before I come back to the rural capital folks. When I do come back, Monty, um, I want to share with you a question that has just come in around who took the lead in developing the referral form that you all are using and how you've worked with partners to make sure that that form is accessible. Um, so we'll cover that when uh, we come back to you, but uh, I'd like to go now to Anson. Um, and Anson, you know, part of the big picture here, as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation today, was that the Texas State Legislature had decided to move VR under the umbrella of the Texas Workforce Commission. And as the State Director for Adult Ed, your agency was already housed under TWC. How did you see your role in helping your local adult ed providers to adapt to this new state law around voc rehab? Um, well, I want to thank everybody and uh, give everybody a welcome from Texas. Um, we had transferred the Adult Education and Literacy uh, Program, the AFLA program, in 2013, and um, that was a pretty uh, big transfer in terms of just uh, state operations and then local grants, and, and, and then, as Doug mentioned, kind of a uh, uh, operational and uh, objective focus uh, to being a much more workforce-oriented program. Um, and when the VR program transferred in 2016, um, we kind of, you know, had been in the the uh, evolution of just integrating adult ed, and then the VR program came on, which was significantly bigger, um, about 1,800 uh, full-time employees, about $309 million, and about 96,000 customers. So um, I had a good sense, you know, having done the adult education transfer, that this was going to be quite a big transfer um, and there was just going to be a lot of uh, kind of biz, uh, work related to that in terms of just kind of organizational focus and just the day-to-day -day management. Um, so having that in mind, I was also very elated and, and excited about this transfer because um, we had had a good history in Texas of working um, well, with persons with disabilities in adult education and literacy. Uh, personally, I had done here at the Workforce Commission 10 years ago, training in our workforce um, solutions offices, our workforce board operated offices um, in learning disabilities identification. Um, and that had been very popular. And so there was a 10 year workforce system kind of engagement with vocational rehab. And then in the adult ed side, there was, um, also a long history of training related specifically to learning disabilities, uh, reading and dyslexia and those types of topics. So we had a strong culture in the state um, and knew that because of the high incidence rate of individuals with disabilities in adult education, particularly uh, intellectual disabilities, that, that this was gonna be a great fit in far, as far as the transfer goes. Um, I think the history um, and then the fact that we had a deep bench of um, local champions uh, really kind of helped me feel very confident that once things had settled down enough here, um, it would not take long to get things moving forward in terms of real customer service delivery that was integrated. Um, in terms of my role, I uh, just know, and we have a, a long Standing culture at this workforce commission, a 20 year culture of integration and collaboration, kind of a model of uh, don't try to do everything yourself, but find the organizations in your community that do uh, the work that the customer needs the best and coordinate and collaborate with them. That is just kind of like a default um, way of thinking here in Texas. Um, but I also know we're really busy, um, and uh, I knew that putting some funding out uh, would really probably go a long way to help uh, jumpstart and grease kind of the initial startup and collaboration and the discussions that you're hearing uh, uh, the adult education and VR teams talk about these early convenings um, 
so what I did was um, through our AFLA funding that uh, Monty May re referred to, um, the state leadership money, um, I uh, funded through our workforce boards um, what I call what we called a workforce integration grant. These were small $30,000 grants to each of our 28 local workforce development boards with the sole intention of funding activities related to convening the partners and developing um, a plan using kind of the SWOT analysis um, method, the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats method. And so by putting that money out, um, $30,000, not a big amount of money, but enough to, as they did in rural capital, um, bring in an outside facilitator and essentially take a day or two to really sit there and work on the topic of integration. And it started, um, I attended many of these events, they started with really, what do you do every day? What is your job? What are your performance measures? What are your objectives? Um, and getting the three main partners, um, oftentimes other partners like our community colleges um, were involved in these discussions, um, but really getting them together to talk shop in the bare fundamentals of what they did, and then view themselves um, by the end of the afternoon sometimes in these meetings um, to say like, okay, what, what are we doing well? What can we do better? What are some new opportunities we've uh, realized today? Um, and what's the work to be done in the future? So um, it was it was a great investment, um, one of the best you know investments I probably made for such a small dollar amount, even in a big a state like Texas. Um, it was not that big of an expenditure, but the outcome, the return on that investment was tremendous. So I, I really saw my role as facilitating um, and then funding this jump start, um, and I and I just knew once we did that, we would probably get a lot of activity going. And then I could go from there in terms of what are the next pieces um, that we needed to do uh, in terms of potential policy or requirements or additional funding to take us to the next step. That's great. Thank you, Anson. And I think it's helpful for folks to know, you know, we are highlighting rural capital um, in our brief and um, as part of today's conversation because they have a pretty mature partnership. There are also other regions around Texas, um, certainly in the Dallas area, also in the actual city and county of, uh, or city of Austin, uh, where there's been other really interesting collaborations going on. Um, Anson, I want to go back to something you just said about using your WIOA title to adult education leadership dollars to help support this kind of collaboration. I know, you know, you said it was kind of a modest amount of money of $30,000 for each of your uh, kind of regional workforce areas, but what advice do you have for advocates in other states about how they might make the case for something like this? Because not everybody would necessarily see this as a natural um, use for those dollars, and obviously there's a lot of demands um, for that money. What, what advice would you offer to folks? Well, um I think it goes back to this kind of idea of the the, the uh, whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And um, we've always wanted to have adult education and literacy um, be seen kind of as a solution provider, not just an education provider. Um, and, you know, I knew and I know that folks like Doug and Francesca uh, out there in the field, they, they really uh, come to work every day with the idea that their customers are coming for a wide variety of solutions to sometimes a lot of situations and challenges. Um, and, you know, just providing, you know, a, a high school equivalency program or an ESL program is really only hitting one uh, dimension of what that individual needs for their own personal objectives and success. And, and so we, you know, we saw this in, in adult education and literacy, but anybody that really reads, you know, WIOA and is implementing it knows the, 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 the law is very much focused on that idea of uh, collaboration and not on siloed operations. Um, each of the system partners in WIOA is looking for the highest impact for their customers. Um, and by co-enrolling and leveraging the whole system, um, you can get better in a return on that investment of each of the constituent programs um, rather than trying to go it alone 
And, you know, by going it alone, you're, you're doing, you know, two things that are, I would consider uh, uh, de detrimental or probably just foolish. One is you're not using the money that's allocated out there to the fullest extent possible across the programs. Uh, an adult education student is often looking for work. They often have disabilities. And there's no reason why leveraging and bringing that higher fiscal impact to the customer um, shouldn't be the default mechanism of thinking in terms of getting the most out of our system. We always hear people complain about not having enough money. My response is typically like, well, how much are you leveraging from other services that you can bring to bear for the customers? Um, the other thing that you get out of this is you, you're, you're getting uh, a reduction in the kind of uh, uh, zaniness that sometimes we put our customers through by having them bounce around to different agencies um, in an area like the rural capital area, having to go in very long distances sometimes to get different services, low income, underskilled individuals in our communities, those with disabilities, you know, that is often really not an option in terms of uh, transportation and time and, and those kind of things. So we're, we're having a, a fiscal impact in terms of positive, um, um, uh, more money to bear for the customer, but a reduction in kind of the uh, wasted time and effort of on the customer's part in terms of uh, shuttling around and trying to figure out how to make uh, these complicated systems make sense for their personal lives. We always see, and many of the folks on this call probably represent areas of rural areas, we always find a lot of innovation there. Um, the ca rural capital area is no different. It's got some of the highest growing counties in the country, but then some also very big rural areas. And so we, we see that, you know, you, and you hear from the individuals on this call, quite a bit of um, um, kind of uh, a long-term uh, integration uh, uh, innovation. The last thing I would say is, uh, in terms of the WIOA Title II state leadership funding, the AFLA funding, um, there is a portion that's called leadership funding, state leadership funding. It's a set aside in the federal statute. And so for advocates uh, that are listening, the point to be made here about that funding is, is it's not an option for the state um, agency that runs the AFLA program to use these dollars for the purpose of integration. Um, WIOA actually uh, changed the game um, a little bit on the state leadership uh, funding in Section 223. And um, in, uh, I believe it's Section A1 or A1A of the state leadership section of, uh, of, of the um, AFLA, there's, it's, it's required funding to uh, spend dollars um, allocated by the federal government for the alignment of adult education and literacy with other core programs in WIOA and One Stop Partners, and specifically for the, the development of career pathways. You heard Doug Mudd talking about the development of the integrated education and training programs that we promote so greatly here in Texas. And I mean, I didn't have, you know, at the end of the day, I didn't have an option not to spend this money. It's a, a federal requirement. So if the great ideas don't make using this money uh, make sense to state leaders, the requirement surely probably will ring a bell for them. Great. Thanks so much, Anson. And we did have to get a question about when your, your grants went out. And I think that was 2016 that those $30,000 grants uh, went out to support systems integration. Um, I want to go back now to Monty. Monty, we had this question come in about who took the lead in developing the referral form that you all have used and how you've worked with partners to make forms accessible. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, actually, the lead was the three agencies. We actually divided up and equal numbers of representatives from all three agencies came together and developed the referral form. If nothing else, it's just how to protect personal identifying information or HIPAA rights of individuals. So what we ended up coming up with is each individual agency that is referring a customer would register their customer in our local job matching system. So when they made a referral, it wasn't necessarily referring personal information that you know could compromise the individual. It was just saying this individual has this job matching number. 
and the partner would look up in the system the information on the customer and make direct contact from the referral form. And um, I can very much say that it was equally put together from all three parties and by no means was the final document. I think the referral form has changed four times in the last two and a half years and just to streamline it and make it easier access to the partner agencies. Great. Kind of um, so, yeah, no, that's great. And I, I do want to pull back the camera lens a little bit and, and ask you how you as partners are evaluating what success looks like. Is it about the number of cross referrals that happen? Is it about improved performance outcomes for the people you're serving? What measures are you looking at in terms of defining what success looks like for, for systems integration here? And it's kind of all three. Of, of course, we did decide to track a number of referrals among agencies. And did it take individuals 48 hours to make contact? And that was very important just because we needed to confirm that this was ongoing and continuous. And so there are numbers associated with it that we do report to the board. But more importantly, I think it's that frontline staff know each other and know what each other does and can make educated referrals to an agency and not just send someone to the front desk asking, can I be served? It's a whole different matter when frontline staff receive a referral and actually call the individual to set up an appointment. So it's it's more staff contacting the referring person and makes contact. To me, that's success. It's success when frontline staff know the agency's frontline staff. They can pick up the phone or shoot an email and you know you're gonna get information and agree on the needs of a customer. It makes for a whole lot better co-case management. We've had some great success stories, uh, both from adult ed, increasing our ability to send people to training and sending individuals to BR, BR referring back to us for workforce services. Um, that's success. That's great. Um, and I just, we've gotten a couple of questions about geography and numbers. So just to sort of, again, situate everybody, we're talking about a nine county region that's home to about 1 million people in central Texas surrounding the city of Austin. As Anson mentioned, some of the communities in this nine county area are sort of suburban or exurban communities and some are more rural. So there's quite a diversity even within the nine counties. Um, and then to the point that Monty was just making about numbers of referrals, um, we talk about this a little bit in the in the brief that we just put out, but in the most recent program year, there were 350 people that were referred from one of these three partner agencies to another one as part of this sort of systems integration and, and um, cross-system collaboration work. So Robin, I want to turn to you um, and ask you about how you've used data systems to track referrals. Did you develop a formal policy to, to guide your collection and use of data? Did you have a more informal working protocol? And kind of what's behind my question is my guess is a lot of folks uh, who are listening to today's conversation are thinking, but you know, look, we have has HIPAA requirements about people's privacy and how do you protect that? And how can you do a handoff, a warm handoff and referral if you're protecting somebody's privacy? So um, can you talk a little bit about how you've used data systems? Yes, hello, my name is Robin Ferris and I'm a vocational rehabilitation counselor for about 10 years now. And I'm also the uh, TWC liaison counselor. So I am the point of contact between vocational rehabilitation in Round Rock uh, in this area um, with the workforce solutions in the um, in the north counties, and um, so what happens is if we have a referral, um, we start with the referral form, like Monty said, and um, one of say for example, my staff members will fill out the referral form if a customer of ours needs 
workforce solution services or adult ed services and they select um, which services they need and then I'm the point of contact and I go into SharePoint so um, a very nice person developed um, a very good SharePoint and um, we've made a couple adjustments and then I upload it and then the person on the other side of it um, is a point of contact and they get assigned to the person and they have to call them within 48 hours um, so vice versa when workforce refers to VR, I'm the person on the other end who basically calls that person and introduce myself, introduce our services, and ask if they would like to apply for services. And because the systems are completely different, I have access to um, what Monty said, which is called work in Texas. So basically, um, most of the information we need is in work in Texas, like their address, phone number, um, sometimes their social security number. So what I'll do is I'll go in our system and I look up their social to see if they're already a customer or if um, they've been a previous customer because then other information will already be in our system. Um, if it's not, I do a name search and that's the only other way to look for them. Um, if they're not, um, then in work in Texas is just a simple phone number. So I always call them and introduce myself and explain our services. And then nine times out of 10, they usually um, do want to apply for services and we get a case started for them. And then a, a VR counselor contacts them within two to three business days. But I've already made that contact. So back in the computer, I put in um, into the SharePoint um, that I contacted them within 48 hours. But then later, once I find out who the VR counselor is that's assigned to them, I go back into the SharePoint and um, I put in who that person is, their phone number and their email, so that um, the referral is considered closed at that point and um, it's a, an official handoff. So um, instead of just sending them, hey, go to Robin Ferris at Workforce Solutions, you know, we're across town right now, we're not integrated for a few more months, so that's why we have a specific process in place. And um, I would say it's informal, but um, I tend to get militant sometimes when people don't follow the process because um, it doesn't do any good for our customers when, um, you know, you just say, hey, go over there and call, um, call this number or call this person because we haven't agreed upon referral process. So I've been over to the Workforce Solutions several times um, training their staff, um, including adult ed, on how to make an appropriate re uh, VR referral. So it's really important to have those trainings. Um, we had disability sensitivity training and, you know, just explaining our services because we'll get often questions that they think that our services are the exact same services as the workforce, but just for people with disabilities. So I have to clear up that, no, we can offer a lot more disability-related services to help remove those barriers to employment. And then oftentimes when their barrier is removed, we can actually send them back to workforce to help them with other things such as resumes or job, job seeker workshops um, to help them ultimately find that job when they're ready to look for work. That is great. Um, and I, I appreciate the detail that you've offered there, Rob. And we're getting a lot of questions about the um, it, folks really have a deep interest in the materials that you all have developed. So we will certainly be following up again, as I said, at the front end of today's conversation with a recording of today's webinar and a link to written materials. Um, I know folks are interested in seeing a copy of the guest reference that the rural capital folks have mentioned. There's folks who are interested in seeing a copy of the referral form. Um, we will absolutely follow up to share what materials are available um, and that the rural capital folks feel comfortable sharing. I know they're really interested in supporting others around the country who are also working on these issues. Um, one more question for Robert and Robin um, on the VR side, and then I'll come to Doug. We're getting some great additional questions in. If you have a question, this is a good time to put it in the chat box so we make sure to answer it. Um, but many of the advocates who are listening to today's conversation are in states where the voc rehab system is not housed in the same state agency as the adult ed system. So what advice do you have for how those local folks can be thinking about systems collaboration at the local level, regardless of how well things are integrated at the state level in their state? 
I would definitely say the intra-agency trainings have been a huge impact. Um, for example, if someone isn't sure if it's an appropriate referral, they know they can call me to ask the question before they put this person through the whole process because on our side, it does take several weeks and sometimes months to get everything finalized and going and determine eligibility. So, of course, you don't want to make a referral if someone, um, you know, if it's not an appropriate service to begin with. Um, so, we have those points of contact that know each other and they get um, siphoned off to the right counties um, because it's split up. I do the north and then there's someone who does east and then there's someone who does south. So, those first people always have to follow up. Um, but we've always had a good relationship even before all of this with our workforce solutions. We've always had someone in, um, you know, coming to do trainings and um, being a, a face um, to the VR services and a representative so that's if they have questions. I get que questions all the time from Ani staff, hey, is this person a good thing? What do you think I should do? And that's really great that they're actually, they are for sure utilizing our services. And then it's actually vice versa. I'll call Chris Caballero and ask about WIOA and different trainings so that when we do that handoff, it really is effective and we're not just sending someone over there, you know, willy-nilly for no reason. That's great. Um, so again, I want to encourage folks, if you have additional questions, please do submit them in the chat box. Um, Doug, I want to turn to you now. Um, we've talked a bit about this today in our conversation. We also talk about it in the brief that we did, but two of the activities that have been really important in rural capital are technical assistance and professional development. Um, everything from that kind of cross-agency training that we were just talking about to, you know, just, just providing training to frontline staff. Uh, Robin talked about the importance of um, disability sensitivity training so that adult educators know, you know, kind of what questions am I allowed to ask and how, how might I go about this? Um, I think I have an adult learner who might need a screen reader or might need hearing aids. Is that something that VR might help with or is that out of scope? You know, can you talk about what advice you would have for other state agency leaders that might want to provide similar technical assistance or professional development to their local partners? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, for state agency leaders, <clears throat> I would first advise, um, you know, getting together with a local uh, voc rehab and, and workforce partners and ADL provider and finding out what you don't know uh, first prior to, to planning the PD and, and tech assistance. You know, you don't know what you don't know. So um, I think it's important in partnering to find out what the other's needs are first and then um, plan trainings around that. Um, for us, uh, leadership from all three of the entities that got together over the course of, uh, I guess, the initial six to eight months, we had several meetings, um, you know, and asked questions and, and got to know one another. You know, we asked questions like, you know, what do you do? What are your performance measures? You know, how does your system work? How do you operate? You know, how do you do business? You know, who's eligible? You know, that's a huge one. Who's eligible for service? How do you, how, do you, uh, how are they eligible? How do you document? You know, um, questions like who is an appropriate referral? You know, we also kind of talked about, you know, the day in the life of a VR counselor or the day in the life of a, uh, a workforce counselor. You know, what are, what are they thinking? What are they seeing? You know, and, and all these questions, you know, we were able to, uh, you know, bring together and, and get some ideas for, for uh, technical assistance and also for PD. So after meeting, um, you know, we basically use the expertise of each partner to educate the other partners. Um, however, I do say that most of our training initially was about how to do that referral process. So our workforce partners took the lead on that, um, training front frontline staff of, of new uh, of all three entities on a step-by-step -step process of our newly created referral system. So it was a, a new training for everyone, you know, so that was great. And this training was successful, I think, um, because it was a structure that was co-created all together. So, and then that was, you know, about built that relationship, you know, that we were talking about, you know, establishing. So, um, another piece of advice uh, I would recommend is, is don't stop meeting and training, you know. Um, you know, we're definitely not perfect in this area, you know. Um, staff turnover happens, changes occur, you know, employees leave, um, and it's important to continue to train uh, for new employees because new points of contact, you know, they, they need to know what they're doing, um, right? 
So, and lastly, I think uh, to plan a good training and tech assistance, it's important to continue to self-assess and to find out, you know, what's going well, what's not, and then train accord accordingly. So, for us, we've noticed, um, you know, between voc rehab and AEL, uh, we noticed there was a lack of referral. So, we got together with voc rehab, senior management, um, discussed, you know, what might be the problem. So on our adult ed side, you know, we discovered, you know, we need to train our adult ed staff on, you know, like you mentioned, uh, how to have a conversation with someone who you think may need services, but they don't necessarily disclose a disability. So, you know, we, we had a VR trainer meet with our adult ed staff to, you know, to kind of train us on how to have that, you know, quote unquote, diagnostic conversation with students, you know, who may have a learning disability, but they don't really recognize it and they haven't, you know, disclosed it. Um, so, you know, those kind of trains are very important. Um, so, great. yeah, so to put it in a nutshell, I, I, you know, me, you know, listen, you know, train and repeat. Great. Thanks so much, Doug. I want to go back to Anson to close us out here. Um, Anson, I want to sort of flag for folks that your state adult ed program has very deliberately not issued major policy guidance on the topic of voc rehab, although you have included explicit language in your WIOA Title II request for applications, sort of directing local providers to, to facilitate referrals and co-enrollment with VR partners. So can you talk about briefly why you made those decisions to not issue major policy guidance yet, but to include it in your RFP? Sure thing. Um, we we really took the approach to first knowing uh, that this was going to be a massive transfer. I was wanting to be respectful not to lay down any kind of initial requirements of an outside system to the R, the adult ed system to the R, you know, in the first year. Um, because I knew there was so much dust to settle with just the integration. Um, so there was kind of a, a, a kind of a tactical side to this, but the real, the real kind of side of, in terms of the goal of where we wanted to go was uh, that I felt confident we had a good sense that we had a lot of innovation out there. I mentioned the historical kind of hist the historical kind of initiatives we had had, but I really wanted to learn, um, you know, what would this look like in terms of what local great practices, things like we're hearing today are happening that we might develop policy around if needed. Um, I really wanted to kind of not put any kind of shackles on innovation from the onset, um, but let things grow, let the system kind of figure itself out, seed the funding, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of get this going in terms of uh, the meetings and the discussions and the development of things like these tools and stuff you've heard today. But uh, th then come on in a year or two um, with any needed guidance or direction. Um, and so I really wanted a light touch, um, but we did put a requirement in our request for applications that the teams get together. Uh, this is a macro drive at the state level for a, an integrated system. Um, and it was a WIOA driven uh, integration system. And I knew that, you know, at a minimum, a good requirement will give people a good reason to get to the table when they're really busy. So the requirement in the RFA to kind of convene, get together, um, combined with the, uh, uh, the funding really helped kind of get things going. And then we're just getting at the phase of saying, are there some other overlays of guidance that we might need to go to? Um, the one area that we do have some um, uh, policy around has to do with our um, WIOA um, uh, uh, Department of Education required assessment policy, where we do require what we call in Texas a comprehensive assessment, which is not just testing and basic skills, but really a full qualitative interview with each student in adult education to find out really what are their goals and objectives, what are their uh, aspirations, um, what are their skills coming in, um, as well as their career op uh, options and their career aspirations, but also what possible disabilities or um, identified disabilities do they have, so that right there in the first moments of a student's experience in adult education literacy, 
we can start to work the referrals to appropriate agencies to help really um, uh, uh, bring a, a broader array of supports for the individual right from the beginning. And that's what you're hearing the rural capital folks doing is really this kind of initial touch integration. You just hear all this interactivity happening in a way that protects privacy but gets the job done for the customer. Great. Thank you so much, Anson. We are at time here. So again, we will be emailing out a recording to today's conversation along with links to resources. Our partner, Sandy Goodman at World Education and National College Transition Network is working on a companion guide on systems integration in Texas that's gonna highlight examples from multiple parts around the state. Um, so if you're interested in receiving that guide, we'll certainly be sharing that in the future when that comes out later this spring. Um, and you can also be in touch with NCTN directly if you want to learn more about that. Um, thank you again, all of you, for joining us today. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope that you'll join us for another webinar or NSC event again soon.